Hello and welcome to I Know Dino. Keep up with the latest dinosaur discoveries in science with us. I'm Garrett. And I'm Sabrina. And today in our 490th episode, we're just 10 away from 500. And we'll be covering a bunch of new dinosaur news this episode. We've got a new stegosaur with strange armor and a new iguanodontian from Morocco. Both of those are Sabrina's news items, so I'm going to learn all about them. Yeah. We also have a dinosaur connection challenge. And of course, our dinosaur of the day, Eo Tyrannus. And we'll cap it off with a fun fact. But before we get into all of that, we want to thank some of our patrons. And this week we have two new patrons to thank. And they are Iraptorsaurus and Bro Davis. Thank you both very much for joining. And then rounding out our shout outs, we've got Toon Rex, Chris, Ayrton and Everett, Southeastern Kaiju, Vincentrosaurus, Ecosaurus, Brooke, and John. Thanks to some feedback in our listener survey, we're going to be starting a new listener question segment on our show. If you have a question or other feedback for us, you can go to bit.ly slash dino questions, all lowercase. This isn't the only time you'll hear that URL, but (laughs) we're going to add that segment into the show because we get a lot of questions from all sorts of myriad of places on the internet. And in the coming months, we're probably going to turn some of those off so that it's easier to have one source where people ask us questions and give us feedback. So we're trying to slowly transition to that. This way, you also don't have to wait until the once a year or so when we do a listener Q&A episode. Yeah. Yeah. So we figured we'd stretch it out into an ongoing segment. And so if you have a question, bit.ly slash dino questions, all lowercase, is the place to go to ask us questions. Or if you have other feedback, like if we make a mistake, for example, we get something wrong about a scientific instrument or something. Or if you have something interesting to add, like you have a pet that did something similar to a dinosaur behavior we talk about, we love that kind of feedback. So anything you have feedback question-wise, that's the place to go. We don't know how much feedback we're going to get, so we might not be able to share all of the feedback, but we love hearing from you. And we will read every piece of feedback that we get. All right, jumping into the news, we're starting off with our new stegosaur, Thyreosaurus atlassicus. Maybe you can tell where that name's coming from. Thyreophoran, which oh. includes ankylosaurs and stegosaurs. At least that was my first thought when I saw the name. I didn't even recognize the thyrea part of thyreophoran in that. What? Yeah. And you're the thyreophoran enthusiast. <laughs> I am. I, I guess it sounded like it was just Greek to me. And I was like, is, is like thyreos or something, an, an island in Greece or something? That was what I was thinking. Well, it is an ancient Greek word, thyreos. You're right about that. It means, quoting from the paper here, quote, an oblong shield that was first used by Hellenistic armies and later adopted by other peoples. And it's a reference to the osteoderms of the specimen, end quote. I think that's lodged deep somewhere in my brain. (laughs) (laughs) So this stegosaur, it was named by Omar Zafadi and others, and this was published in Gondwana Research. And like other stegosaurs, it walked on all fours. It had a long neck, a bulky body, a decent length tail, and a small head. But this one is known for its, quote, asymmetric, bizarre dermal armor. Hmm. It comes from the now Atlas Mountains of Morocco. It lived in the Middle Jurassic, and it was found in the Elmer's Three Formation. The fossils were found in 2021. And this is an area where, like, Spicomelis was found. That's the one with the armor that was fused to its ribs. Yeah, I love that one. Yeah. I wish they had found more of that dinosaur rather than a new dinosaur, I dare say. I think there are plenty of dinosaurs and parts of dinosaurs to be found here. It's also interesting that this one is named for its asymmetric dermal armor when there's really no more bizarre dermal armor than you get on Spicomelis armor that's fused directly to a rib. I could see that argument, but it's it's bizarre because it's bizarre for a, a stegosaur. Oh, good point. Yeah. So Thyreosaurus is closely related to the stegosaur Dacentrurus. And that stegosaur lived in the late Jurassic and maybe into the early Cretaceous in what's now Europe. It's been found in England, France, Spain, and Portugal. It's large with a broad gut. It 
has short legs and long arms or forelimbs. It walked on all fours with two rows of small plates on its neck and two rows of longer spikes along its tail. Yeah. Yeah. That's the one that sort of shifts from plates to spikes halfway through. Yeah. I don't know. I don't think it's the only one that does that, but it's one of them. But that's just to give you an idea of how, since these are close relatives, Thyreosaurus helps us to better understand how Thyreophorans evolved. Again, the group that includes Stegosaurs and Ankylosaurs. They found a partial skeleton, some disarticulated vertebrae and ribs, a limb bone, possibly a fibula, and associated armor. And that fibula, it's, it's a possible fibula because it's slender and rod-like, but it was really poorly preserved. So they just, they know it's a limb bone. They found 21 dorsal rib remains. Three of them are relatively complete. Four of the ribs are fractured or they were deformed during fossilization. And they think this dinosaur probably had a narrow rib cage. There are also six dermal elements they found. That's parts of the armor, also known as osteoderms. And all of these pieces are considered to be from one individual. Thyreosaurus had thick, up to four centimeters or over one and a half inches, sub-ovate, that's kind of egg-shaped, to sub-rectangular-shaped osteoderms. And these osteoderms vary between five and over 30 centimeters long. Oh, so up to about a foot. Yeah, and also really thick. Yeah, I mean, one and a half inches, I guess, is thick for a stegosaur. Mm -hmm. But ankylosaurs got much thicker osteoderms. Again, we're talking about a stegosaur, <laughs> though. <laughs> <laughs> it kind of throws me off that it's named Thyreosaurus because I would have thought you would name something that, like after the clade Thyreophora if it was basal, right? If it didn't fit into a stegosaur or a ankylosaur group mm. because then it'd be like, oh, it's this, this Thyreophoran and that's what we know about it. They're going for the shield aspect of it. Oh, I see. Gotcha. Yeah. yeah when you describe them as sort of long ovals, I guess that makes sense. Mm -hmm. There's also asymmetrical texture on the sides of these osteoderms. One side has small pits and fiber bundles, and the other side has a cross-hatched pattern, and it's wavy. And this is different from other stegosaurs and ankylosaurs. The osteoderms are in a recumbent position over the body, so they're lying flat instead of erect. So more like an ankylosaur than on a stegosaur where they <laughs> pop straight up? Yes. But when they did the bone histology of the osteoderms, they found that it was similar to stegosaur tail spines. Hmm, okay. So they cut open the osteoderms, and they also cut open the histology on one of the fragmentary ribs. And from the osteoderms, they learned that they're compact or dense, and there's a lot of bone remodeling. So they have this non-fibrous appearance, which you don't usually see this in ankylosaur or titanosaur osteoderms. But it has been seen in some plates and tail spines of adult stegosaurs. Okay. So that that's one of the features that makes them think it's a stegosaur and not a ankylosaur? Well, I would say it's more when they compare all of the fossils to other stegosaurs, it had features in common with stegosaurs. From the rib, they found at least six lags, but some of those, and those are lines of arrested growth, so Think about when you're counting tree rings to figure out how old a tree is. It's similar to that. But some of the lags are hard to count. So they're so closely spaced together, there are double and triple lags. So it's hard to estimate the total number of them. They think it's an adult, but it wasn't skeletally mature. It was still growing. Based on the number of lags and the secondary remodeling, this individual is thought to be somewhere between a young to old adult, and it's estimated to be medium to large in size, about six meters or nearly 20 feet long, but again, it wasn't done growing. And again, the genus name, Thyreosaurus, comes from the shield elements, and the species name, Atlasicus, refers to the Atlas Mountains of Morocco and North Africa. So we're starting to hear about more and more dinosaurs from this area of the world. Yeah, it's really great that there is a large interest there. I know for a while it's been popular for local people to go into the mountains and dig out dinosaur bones and sort of sell them on a private market, but it, for whatever reason, hadn't been a huge place where a lot of scientists were going, or maybe they just didn't have the right contacts. But now as some of the unusual bones pop up or some of the better preserved stuff, sometimes we're seeing it get into 
the hands of researchers, which is really awesome. And then next, we've got a new Iguanodontian. I know that's everyone's favorite. <laughs> <laughs> Yay, ornithopods. That gets everybody all pumped up. I still think they're cool. They, they don't get the recognition they deserve. Well, Iguanodontians especially are cool because they have that permanent thumbs up hand spike mm -hmm. going on, which is just such a unique adaptation that we're still not really positive what it was for. Well, this one, the paper calls it unexpected. It was published in the Journal of Vertebrate Paleontology by Filippo Maria Rotatori and others. And its name is Hesperonyx Martin Hoto Mesorum. That is quite the species name. Can you guess where the species name might come from? It sounds like two or three people's names smushed together to me. <laughs> it's in honor of, quote, Michael Martinho and Carla Alexandra Tomas of curating and preparing fossils in the Musée da Lorinha, end quote. Okay, so it's only two people, but two people with multi-syllabic names mm. <laughs> that they've put together. <laughs> It is a bit of a mouthful. <laughs> I think the sorum part is the plural suffix that they use when it's named after multiple people. And yeah. Just adds to it. Yeah. Makes it an even longer species name rather than just an I like you do with a singular person. The genus name combines the Greek mythological god Hesperus or evening star, which later meant west or western in claw. So Hesperonyx therefore means Western Claw, and it refers to the West region of Portugal where the fossils were found. Hesperonyx is estimated to be, at least the holotype, is three to four meters long, which is about 10 to 13 feet. It walked on two legs. It had a bulky body, a long tail, a small head, short arms, and stout proportions, but it was probably relatively agile. It had toe claws, specifically the paper said claw-like. The images don't look too sharp, so maybe that's why they said claw-like. Yeah, yeah, that's interesting. It's the third Iguanodontian name from that formation after Draconix and Eos Dryosaurus. It's similar in size to Draconix, and there's some overlap between the two, but there's no evidence to show that they were the same species, at least as of now, the author said. So this new Iguanodontian helps show more diversity of small ornithopods from the formation, that's the Lorinha formation. It lived in the late Jurassic in what is now Portugal. That's interesting too, because we were just looking up Eos Dryosaurus, and that Eos part means Eastern, and this one means Western. So when you combine them, you've got the Eastern and Western living in the same spot. <laughs> Guess that's all relative. Yep. <laughs> what's East and what's West when you're living on a sphere. Maybe they split up the territory. Yeah. <laughs> So these fossils, like our stegosaur, were found in 2021. They're found along a beach. And the holotype includes parts of the left leg and feet and part of the left arm and hand. There's the details in the tibia and fibula, as well as a twisted, reduced first foot bone or metatarsal one is what make it unique. So one of its foot bones is twisted a little unusually. It is a little shorter. Yep. That's the sort of thing you got to look for. Yes. <laughs> It's the sort of thing I don't have an eye for at this time. Well, no, I mean, honestly, the only people that notice this are a very select group of researchers who are just staring at all of these bones, studying that specific group of animals to notice those sorts of minute details. That's true. But then it's cool. They get to name a new dinosaur. Mm -hmm. Speaking of the name, there was a comment about the name in the paper, how Hesperonyx was misused in an 1877 book of zoology. There was a misspelling of Hesperonis with an S instead of an X, and that's a junior synonym of the mouse cow mice, and that means that the name Hesperonyx with the X is available to use. So they were defending their use of the name here. And as to where Hesperonyx lived, it lived in a well-vegetated floodplain area with a warm climate with rainy seasons along with other Iguanodontians, it sounds like. Nice. Iguanodontians are really cool. Even if the ornithopods don't get the love that they should. <laughs> and in just a moment, I'll get into a dinosaur connection challenge all about concrete and how it's related to dinosaurs. There are a lot of things that dinosaurs and concrete share in common. It's very interesting. But first, we're going to pause for a quick sponsor break. 
And now on to our dinosaur connection challenge, which is concrete. That's a challenge by Zoe Visaurus. Concrete manufacturing. Yes, I'm mostly talking about manufacturing, but I'm going to talk a little bit about concrete in general. Concrete has been around for thousands of years. It's tricky to define the exact origin of concrete because it's not just one thing. It's a combination of ingredients. So it obviously started out more simple. And then at what point does it become concrete is sort of up for debate, much like how defining the very start of the first dinosaur is difficult to agree on. Oh, good start to the connection challenge. (laughs) Thank you. Also, just like with dinosaurs, not long after concrete first made its appearance, it quickly dominated the landscape. Roman concrete was so important that the Roman architectural revolution is also known as the concrete revolution. Oh, I had no idea. Yeah. Some of the things that were constructed from concrete include aqueducts, bridges, and triumphal arches. Think of the Arc de Triomphe in France, Mm -hmm. except a little bit smaller. The Arc de Triomphe is also made of concrete. All of those things are large structures that made a big impact on their surroundings, much like how dinosaurs did. (laughs) That's true. Dinosaurs might have shaped their landscapes. Yeah, you've talked about with like sauropods, Mm -hmm. just the act of an 80-ton animal walking repeatedly in the same area would literally change the path and change, maybe even reshape hills and things like that. Also like dinosaurs, concrete had unique advantages allowing for its increased size. Since the beginning, concrete has allowed for construction on a larger scale than previous materials. For example, the Roman Pantheon was the largest dome in the world when it was built, and it kept that title for over a thousand years. That's pretty good. Yeah, it's amazing. To this day, it's still the largest unreinforced solid concrete dome. And unreinforced is there meaning that there's no steel in it or around it holding it up. That's impressive. Yeah, it is really cool. And we've been to the Pantheon and it's just awe-inspiring that this 2,000-year-old huge concrete structure is still standing. Mm -hmm. It's just amazing. And the fact that it's unreinforced is even crazier because... Concrete is really strong under compression, but it's really weak under tension, and steel is the opposite. So in modern concrete, you embed steel in it, and then the steel is strong for tension, and the concrete's strong for compression, and it's super, you know, one of the strongest building materials you can imagine. That's why dams and things are made out of it. But at the time, they didn't know how to reinforce the concrete so with steel, so it was a little bit weaker, but still can last thousands of years. Another example is that much of the Colosseum is built from concrete. So that's the first two connections. (laughs) (laughs) That they took off in a major way very quickly and that they also have advantages for making things very large. I guess I also said that the origins Mm -hmm. are difficult to define. So maybe there's three connections so far. Concrete starts as a crushed mixture which solidifies into a monolithic rock when water is added to it. A lot of people use the word cement to mean concrete, but cement is really just a component of concrete. Most modern concrete uses Portland cement, and Portland cement is made up of limestone that's ground up and heated with a few other ingredients like clay. It's actually a very specific mixture, but I don't want to get into all the chemistry because it's a little bit much. And not enough dinosaurs. Yeah, I couldn't. there weren't connections within that element of it, other than that Portland cement is made up of the same elements as dinosaurs, but that's true about most things on Earth. (laughs) Portland cement is named after the Isle of Portland in the English Channel, and the rock there has a similar color to Portland cement, and Portland rock was famous for buildings like St. Paul's Cathedral that used the rock, and thus Portland cement was named after the rock in Portland. But just to be clear, Portland cement wasn't invented on the Isle of Portland, and there isn't really any actual connection from Portland cement to the Isle of Portland other than a superficial appearance. Hmm. The Isle of Portland is part of the Jurassic Coast UNESCO World Heritage Site. There's the connection. (laughs) Yep. Another connection. Uh, The Jurassic Coast is a pretty long stretch of the southern coast of Great Britain. You can actually see a map of the entire UNESCO area on their website. I'll put a link on our Discord because I thought it was kind of fun to see the exact boundaries of the Jurassic Coast outlined. 
The Jurassic Coast includes an amazing record of the Mesozoic from the Triassic through the Cretaceous, which is what made it a UNESCO World Heritage Site. Makes sense. That's a long span of time. Yeah, it's basically the entire span of dinosaur existence. I think there are a couple little missing pieces here and there. Nothing's 100% complete in the geological record, but it's about as good as it gets when it comes to dinosaur paleontology. Rock from the Isle of Portland is essentially made out of the Jurassic Coast limestone. And I say essentially because the quarries aren't on the coast, but it's the same formation because the coast obviously has changed over time. And this was basically all underwater on and off because there's a ton of marine stuff in the limestone. There are Jurassic era fossils found in buildings that were built of Portland limestone. (laughs) Unfortunately, I couldn't find any actual dinosaur fossils that are embedded in, you know, like the limestone veneers on these buildings. That's not the worst thing, because that means the dinosaur fossils can be studied if they're not embedded in a a building. (laughs) Yeah, there are a fair number of invertebrate fossils that you can find on some of these buildings. But the Isle of Portland does have dinosaur fossils. There are unknown sauropod and theropod bones presumably not in good enough condition to identify from a specific genus or species, or they're just from a part of the body, like a tooth or something that can't necessarily be narrowed down to a specific species. And there are also dinosaur footprints on the island, including sauropod footprints. Yay! (laughs) So that's the cement piece of concrete and how it's connected to dinosaurs. The main other ingredients are water and aggregate. Aggregate is most of the concrete by volume. Usually it's sand and crushed stone or gravel. Technically, you could use anything, so you could use fossils in there if you wanted to. But the whole point of aggregate is mostly just to fill up space and do it cheaply. The cement reacts with the water to harden around the aggregate and binds everything together. That's just how concrete works, in case you're wondering. And the Crystal Palace dinosaurs are an early example of modern concrete using Portland cement. You may remember they were built in 1854, if my memory serves. Or 1852. I'd have to look it up. Yeah, something I read was talking about how the concrete set in 1854, so that might be when they finished the installation of it. Mm. And the fact that they're made out of concrete is actually a bit of a problem because with concrete, especially reinforced concrete, which the Crystal Palace dinosaurs are. They have steel inside of them. If you get cracks and water gets into those cracks, the freeze-thaw cycle can break apart the concrete, and then also rust can get to the steel inside, and then the steel grows and it breaks them apart, much like how pyrite can inside of a dinosaur bone. When it absorbs water, it can expand and break apart dinosaur bones. So there are conservation issues with concrete, just like there are with dinosaur fossils. So many connections. There are. One last final connection is we've seen many dinosaur tracks replicated in concrete, mostly outside museums, because it's a good way to make them sort of permanent. And then you can have fun walking in them without damaging them because the concrete's nice and durable. That's cool. When I first saw this challenge, I thought of the Crystal Palace dinosaurs, but I'm impressed you found so many other connections. (laughs) I really like concrete. It's a really interesting material and very complicated. The number of chemicals in it is fascinating. I didn't go into it, but the earlier precursors to concrete are also very interesting. Basically types of limestone that are heated up. And then when you add water back to it, it goes through a chemical reaction to solidify. I saw one concrete enthusiast website that claimed that the Great Pyramids were partly made of concrete, Hmm. which I think is a bit of a stretch. It's basically the mortar in between the giant rock blocks, (laughs) which are made out of concrete, which is actually how modern concrete was invented too. A lot of times, I guess what happens is people are working with big pieces of rock and they're trying to stick the rocks together and they come up with concrete. And then later on you realize, wait, we don't even need the rocks anymore. We can just make the whole thing out of concrete. It's happened multiple times throughout history that way. There's probably some analogy to evolution there that we could make too. Another connection. I guess that'd be homoplasy, Mm. evolving separate times, but with the same effect at the end. (laughs) 
All right, we also have a piece of listener feedback. This is from Ryan about our April Fowls episode, episode 488. Ryan is a biochemist, so the part of the episode where we were talking about alpha helixes and beta sheets when it comes to alpha and beta keratin is what they're talking about. And specifically, it's a response to how I sort of tacked on at the end how maybe these beta sheets decayed into alpha helixes because the structures are fairly similar. And you can see how if you cleaved the right bonds, you'd end up with alpha helixes out of the beta sheets. And what they said is that alpha helices and beta sheets are both extremely common structures found in all sorts of proteins. And that's what's being referred to when calling one of the proteins an alpha structure and the other a beta structure. And that alpha keratin, which is now just called keratin, has a lot of alpha helices in it. And beta keratin, now just called CBPs, have lots of beta sheets, hence their names, which is really cool. And I definitely should have remembered this because back in college, when I was studying chemical engineering, I used this application called PyMole, which is a really cool tool for looking at complicated molecules. And there are all these little spirals everywhere. Mm. And those are all alpha helices. So <laughs> I definitely should have remembered that there were all those alpha helices everywhere in proteins. Well, it's been a while. Yeah, it's been like 15 years. It's good that we've got listeners like Ryan who've got our backs. Yes. They also point out, I don't know if we explicitly mentioned this as well as we should have, but the study didn't really confirm that those proteins were in fact originally beta sheets. All they really did was show that if you took a beta sheet under certain conditions, it would turn into an alpha helix. And so it could be that when we see these alpha helices in the fossil record, that they're not actually originally alpha helices. They could be beta sheets that then decayed into alpha helices. It's good to know. The more you know. Mm-hmm. Star wipe. <laughs> <laughs> I did do that while I was saying it. One other interesting detail that I had no idea about is that they said dramatic shifts from high helix to high sheet are maybe not as common, but they do happen. Some prion diseases, for instance, occur when a certain protein misfolds to have beta sheets where it should have alpha helices, and that causes the proteins to clump together. So it can happen either way. If I've learned anything from biology over the years, it's that any possible problem which you could imagine existing happens, mm -hmm. and there's some name for it. Yeah, biology's weird. It is. But cool. And inconsistent. But mm -hmm. that's how evolution happens. Weird, random stuff happening. Well, thank you, Ryan, for giving us that feedback. Yeah, and if anybody else has feedback, you can head to bit.ly slash dino questions. We're mostly looking for questions. That's why it's dino questions. But there is always more to the story than we cover on this podcast. And sometimes we miss stuff that's worth adding. And if you have some information that you think is worth adding, you can let us know on bit.ly slash dino questions. All right, we'll move on to our dinosaur of the day in just a moment. But first, we're going to take a quick break for our sponsors. And now on to our dinosaur of the day, Eo Tyrannus, a request from PaleoMike716 via our Patreon and Discord. So thanks. It was a Tyrannosauroid theropod, maybe you guessed that with the Tyrannus part of the name, that lived in the early Cretaceous in what is now the Isle of Wight, United Kingdom, it was found in the Wessex Formation, is estimated to be up to 15 feet or four and a half meters long, which is large for an early Tyrannosaur. I'm familiar with this one. I'm not always familiar with the dinosaurs of the day now that we're 490 in. <laughs> but Eotyrannus does come up fairly often. Yeah, it does. And Eotyrannus was gracile. It had a long tail. It walked on two legs. It had long arms with three long fingers and claws on them. And it had slender hands. Early reconstructions interpreted Eotyrannus as having much longer arms, but that turns out not to be the case. It had a vaguely rectangular snout, as Darren Nash put it. <laughs> I think that's a good way to describe Tyrannosaurus in general. A little bit boxier of <laughs> a front of a mouth than some of the others. It also had serrated teeth 
and thick fused nasals, and the nasal had a lot of pneumatization, a lot of air-filled cavities. It also had long shin bones and foot bones. But a lot of the skeletons still we don't know. The fossils were first found in 1995 by Gavin Lung, and it's one of the first early known tyrannosaurs. It helps show that early tyrannosauroids were gracile, with the long arms and three fingers on each hand. The fossils were found at a cliffside exposure, which is a pretty fun way to find a fossil. Yeah, it can be great because sometimes it's just a little bit of the animal poking out. And if that's the case and the rest of it's back in the cliff, it's nice and protected from above in a lot of cases. But depending on how much of it is eroded out of the cliff, it's not always as impressive. I was thinking of, you know, you're hiking along and then you see a piece of, I don't know, hand bone or something. <laughs> oh, like eye level? Yeah. Rather than just on the ground? Yeah. That's true. <laughs> So Lung found a hand claw. Oh, that's probably why he used that as the example. Anyway, he took it to Hutt, who was then the curator at the Museum of the Isle of Wight, who went to the site and excavated the rest of the bones. The type species is Eotyrannus lungi, so named after the person who found him, who found the dinosaur. And the genus name Eotyrannus refers to the dinosaur being classified as an early tyrannosaur. It was described in 2001 by Stephen Hutt and others, including Darren Nash, who in 2022, along with Andrea Cow, published a monograph of Eotyrannus. The monograph is based on Nash's PhD thesis. And then the species name, of course, is named in honor of Lung. There are some synonyms of Eotyrannus. They're now nomomnudum. They include Gavinosaurus and Lungosaurus. Fossils of the dinosaur found include parts of the skull, vertebrae, parts of the ribs, arms, legs, and pelvis from a subadult. There's a lack of fusion, so that means it's probably a subadult. Although even though it's a subadult, it's not thought to grow much bigger than its estimated four and a half meter long body. Nation Cow found that the skull does not show longer rostrum proportions, unlike Megaraptor, so it does not have a long jaw. The not long snout shows that tyrannosauroids, quote, were not consistently and perpetually specialized for robust snouts optimized for powerful biting across their history, end quote. Eotyrannus is the second most complete theropod from the Wessex Formation after Neovenator, or Neovenator, depending how you want to say that. <laughs> well, it's the Wessex Formation, so they would probably say Neovenator. Mm. Good point. <laughs> <laughs> Theropods have been found in that area since the 1860s, and many of them are named from fragments. So many of the Eotyrannus bones are broken or fragmentary, and the bones are embedded in hard mudstone. Nash said that Eotyrannus was not a pretty fossil and was difficult to prepare, and that there's still more work to do even in preparing it. Hmm. The holotype was disarticulated before fossilizing, so most of the skeleton was scattered, and that makes it hard to identify a lot of the fossil material. The fossils were found in a plant debris bed with two other skeletons with it. It's possible that an animal drowned and then Eotyrannus was attracted to the carcass, which might have been a battleground between a few theropods and then resulted in some deaths, or Eotyrannus may have been partially scavenged before it was buried, or the specimen may have been deposited in the plant debris bed by a flood. It's hard to know exactly what happened there. But we do know that Eotyrannus lived in a warm environment that had wet and dry seasons, and other dinosaurs that lived around the same time and place include sauropods, ornithopods, such as Iguanodon and Mentelosaurus, the Carcharodontosaurian Neovenator, the Spinosaurus Reparovenator and Ceratosucops, the Dromaeosaur Ornithodesmus, the Compsognathid Aristosuchus and Calamosaurus, as well as other theropods. And other animals that lived around the same time and place include spiders, wasps, fish, amphibians, lizards, turtles, crocodiliforms, plesiosaurs, mammals, and pterosaurs. That's a lot of animals to be found in one area. But the Wessex Formation is a very well-documented one. Mm -hmm. Sounds like it was fairly pleasant to live in, too. Except for all the huge theropods. Well, if you were a huge <laughs> theropod, it would be pleasant. It's interesting to hear that Eotyrannus isn't that well known of a fossil. It goes to show that sometimes really important fossils aren't the prettiest and aren't the most complete animals because just the fact that we know that it had three fingers, long-ish arms, 
and the shape of its head was different than modern tyrannosaurs. It gave us so much more information about those early tyrannosaurs just from those key spots in the body, even if they're not the most beautiful bones that you've ever seen. Yeah, it's nice that somebody worked on them to figure that out. Mm-hmm. And didn't just see them and think like, eh, those, those aren't so pretty. We don't need to prepare those. And for our fun fact, we're going back to Thyreosaurus from earlier. I thought that news article sounded really interesting, so I went ahead and read it as well. Even though it was a stegosaur, not ankylosaur. But it has Thyreo in the name, mm-hmm. so it's all ankylosaurian. I love ankylosaurs. I like stegosaurs too. Part of the reason is because I wanted this specific statement to be my fun fact, and I wanted to confirm it, and that's that Thyreosaurus is thought to be the first stegosaur ever found with its plates flat against its body rather than sticking up off its body. Ooh, that's very ankylosaur-like of it. It really is. Those plates that it has, whether up or down, are technically osteoderms, and again, osteoderm literally translates to skin bone, and they are huge pieces of bone, in this case huge, they're not always huge, but they form directly in the skin. They're not attached to the skeleton in any way like most normal bone is. The armor is famous on dinosaurs like ankylosaurs and stegosaurs, and you can also see them today on things like alligators. But going back to the new stegosaur, Thyreosaurus, if their interpretation is right, the fact that the larger flat sides of the osteoderms have different textures than the edges meant that the osteoderms were flat against the body. That's how they determined that factoid. You, I think you covered that in Thyreosaurus. They were also up to a foot long, like you mentioned. And on a stegosaur, we'd usually expect to see those standing straight up like plates, but instead they're much more like an ankylosaur flat against the body. I wonder if that helps more. It does seem like it would be better armor (laughs) against the body. (laughs) Having spikes sticking out, though, could be pretty useful. And some stegosaurs did have more spike-like osteoderms that stuck up and out. Could be more of a deterrent. Yeah. We also don't know what's covering the plates. If they had any sort of spiky covering on the top, then that could help as well. Thyreosaurus, though, is not even close to the first stegosaur to have things in common with an ankylosaur and things that we really think of as associated with ankylosaurs. It's not too surprising they have a lot in common because ankylosaurs and stegosaurs are extremely close relatives, being thyreophorans or thyreophorans, as I think more people say. The stegosaur Huayangosaurus had a wider head than usual for a stegosaur, making it a little bit ankylosaur-like. And the head also had a small post-orbital horn, meaning a horn behind the eye. Hmm which is something that we see in ankylosaurs. I don't think that that's been found in any other stegosaurs, although we don't always find the skulls. And for example, we don't have the Thyreosaurus skull. Hyangosaurus has also been depicted with even more ankylosaur-like traits. Like what? Well, there's a skeletal drawing by Scott Hartman, which includes large, broad osteoderms on its body and even a tiny tail club at the end of its tail. Well, that is very ankylosaur-like. Yeah. I couldn't find the tail club anywhere in the literature, but Scott Hartman is extremely meticulous and maybe the greatest dinosaur skeletal illustrator around. So I believe it when I see anything in his skeletals because he doesn't just make stuff up. His skeletal is also quite recent. It's from 2016 versus the most recent skeletal description is from 2006. And we've talked about before, sometimes stuff shows up in art before it's in the literature because a lot of these artists talk to paleontologists all the time and they find out about stuff that hasn't been published yet and it starts to work its way into art (laughs) and you get ideas about what might be out there before it's officially published. Yes, The nipple bumps on Triceratops come to mind. Yep. With Huayangosaurus from his skeletal, it has the usual spikes or the thagomizer on its tail, but there is this little tiny tail club in the middle, basically, of those spikes. And the club is so small, it almost looks like a pyga style, the tiny fused tailbone on birds. (laughs) 
So I went into the most recent description from 2006 and I read the whole section on the tail vertebrae just to see if there was anything about fused vertebrae or what happened at the tip of the tail and there isn't anything there. Hmm. So I don't know. I'm excited to find out if this ever gets published on now that it's been in the skeletal drawing for eight years. I would have expected it by now, but who knows? The really weird thing to me is that that club is so dwarfed by the huge spikes that surround it. It just seems like, why is it there? We're just saying how biology is weird. It is. It is very weird. Maybe it was just an issue with the stegosaur that it caused vertebrae to fuse, but it, it's l- much larger than the vertebrae leading up to it. So it doesn't, yeah, it's, it's strange. The skeletal's large oval osteoderms are not quite thyreosaurus in size, not those huge foot-long ovals. They're probably about a quarter of that size. And lots of stegosaurs have been found with osteoderms in addition to their plates. For example, stegosaurus had a neck covered in small pebble-sized osteoderms. Yeah, I love looking at that neck. It is really cool. And we've seen them all over the bottom of heads and things like that too. Definitely a very ankylosaur-like detail. One last thing about Huayangosaurus and its skeletal drawing is that it has huge shoulder spines, very similar to Notosaurus, aka the clubless ankylosaurus. Hmm. Those shoulder spines are also found on the gigant Spinosaurus, which I know Sabrina has covered in a dinosaur of the day. And it's named Gigant Spino part because it has these huge spines. <laughs> Makes sense. On its shoulders. So that's quite a few features that you see on some stegosaurs, which most people associate with ankylosaurs more so than with stegosaurs, partly because stegosaurus doesn't have those features, and that's the main stegosaur people know. But stegosaurus is actually kind of a weird stegosaur, especially with its huge back plates. Most stegosaurs weren't that extreme. For me personally, I think of all these traits as ankylosaur traits because ankylosaurs are my favorites. But I should point out in defense of stegosaurs that stegosaurs had them first. Well, maybe stegosaurs <laughs> should be your favorite. Maybe they should be. For example, gigant spinosaurus lived in the middle to late Jurassic about 160 million years ago, which is earlier than even the very first known ankylosaurs. And thyreosaurus might have been even earlier, currently dated to the middle Jurassic. So they had the armor, they had the horns. On the head, at least small ones, they had the big shoulder spines and possibly even a tiny tail club before ankylosaurs even existed. But in my defense, in human history, the first known armored dinosaur by far was Hylaeosaurus, which is an ankylosaur. And almost no one talks about Hylaeosaurus. They really don't, and it's a fantastic dinosaur. Maybe you could talk more about it. <laughs> I guess so. I got to start bringing up Hylaeosaurus just in everyday conversation. Yeah. Just talking about like what we're going to do for the day. I'd be like, and Hylaeosaurus. The <laughs> other thing is. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of concrete, Hylaeosaurus. Yeah. Well, Hylaeosaurus was made of concrete being one of the Crystal Palace dinosaurs. You're welcome for that one. <laughs> <laughs> And that wraps up this episode of I Know Dino. Thank you for listening. Stay tuned. Next week, we'll be talking about what made dinosaurs so successful, as well as a strange dinosaur that lost all its teeth growing up. Is it Lemosaurus? Spoiler. <laughs> Don't forget to go to bit.ly slash dino questions, too, if you have any questions about dinosaurs that you want us to answer on the show. Thanks again. Until next time. Good day.